And uh, thanks to, to everyone who's tuned in uh, for this talk. Um, and just a, a big thank you to the DRHS because they have just stepped up to the plate in, um, in this kind of programming and, and keeping history going. And uh, it, it's been great. So um, a huge thank you to Aaron and Carolyn and everybody at DRHS. Anyway, well, let's get on to, um, to uh, the talk. We're going to um, be talking about Tinkertown, uh, which is a, a fabulous neighborhood in Duxbury um, and uh, has a long, long history. And there's been a, um, a long, um, in, in delving into kind of the, the background of it, because I thought I knew some of it, uh, I, I learned an awful lot. And um, part of what I learned was that there's been a number of people over the years that have left um, reminiscences and, and histories about the area. Uh, so it was fun to kind of piece those together and uh, see um, how they dovetail or how they don't. So um, I learned a lot and, and hopefully you will too. Uh, but so this is, um, Tinkertown really uh, began in the 18th century, but the, the path to Mattachesit was a very ancient road, probably a Native American path originally, but uh, the path to Mattachesit meant the path to Pembroke. Uh, and it led from the um, farms and the first meeting house uh, of Duxbury to the west. Um, so the, the layout of Elm Street, Toby Garden Street actually happened in 1762, um, but it was described in that layout as being there for, for many years. So it was, um, it was just a formal layout of that, um, that piece. And um, it was really, it, it bisected two large pieces of land. Um, uh, heading west towards um, the, the Bay Path or the Boston Road or whatever you want to call it. We call it Route 53 today, um, heading towards Boston. So um, here is a, a sign about Tinkertown and um, uh, it, it really was settled um, pre-revolution. Uh, and like I said, the, the road was laid out in 1762, but there were families living there before that. Um, the other reason for this was before the, the road layout uh, and the path through Tinkertown was that uh, it led to the Tree of Knowledge where the stage and the mail stopped. And there was always um, uh, people uh, there waiting for the stage to go to Boston. Um, there's a great uh, quote from uh, a man who was a um, student at one of the academies here in 1810, 1820, and he said that he had start he had for many years um, he lived with the Duxbury minister that they would start in their um, in their carriage many nights to the tree of knowledge where we met at the Boston and Plymouth stage for passengers. Uh, they were picking up and, and dropping off passengers. It was about three miles through dense woods. So that dense wor woods was Tinkertown, even though there were families living there. He, he remembered it as very dense woods. Um, why it was um, in such a forsaken place, I never could understand, or why the stages always met, uh, stopped at night. So that's just an early um, glimpse uh, of, of what Tinkertown might have been like. So the name, let's start with the name Tinkertown. Um, uh, a tinker, uh, obviously a mender of pots and pans and, and all. Um, and uh, it was uh, a man named Dillingham. Now the, the traditional histories uh, say it was Jeremiah D Dillingham. Uh, who was the father of um, uh, a woman with a wonderful name called Princess Peterson. She was um, Princess Dillingham before. Um, but it turns out by looking into her, um, into her uh, background and all, her father was actually John Dillingham. Um, so was it John or was it Jeremiah? Jeremiah turns out to have been her brother. And he actually lived in Duxbury for a while before he moved to Maine. 
He was um, the owner of, um, or part owner of the sawmill just outside of Tinkertown. So maybe it was, uh, maybe it was both of them. Maybe it was just her father, John, or else it, it could have been her brother, Jeremiah. Um, but both of them were described as farmers as well as cord wainers. So you can see on the far right screen, that's a cord wainer. That's somebody who, who made shoes. And that uh, occupation will come back into uh, the story of Tinkertown as well. But whoever, w whichever Dillingham it was, he was, um, he was uh, a, a part-time tinkerer and a brazier. That's somebody who works with brass. Before we get too much further uh, into the story of Tinkertown, I, I thought the neighbors who live there or who have lived there would appreciate this because um, uh, to really appreciate the older part of Tinkertown, um, you need to slow down in your car. And, and uh, uh, people just belt through along Elm Street heading west. So uh, you'll see this again, but um, that's my, uh, my hope that after this talk, people will, will slow down and, and kind of uh, enjoy just looking at, at the old houses and the neighborhood. So this is the first um, real detailed map of, of the Tinkertown area. It's from the Ford map of 1833. You can see Island Creek Pond up there. You can see Elm Street and uh, Toby Garden Street coming in there. And there's only really uh, about five houses there. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, almost all the houses, the old houses uh, in Tinkertown. Uh, we'll also talk about Greater Tinkertown, as I call it, um, in, a, in a little bit. But this is the earliest map showing us what Tinkertown looked like um, at the height of the shipbuilding era in Duxbury. And you can see the woods pressing in around it um, and uh, the open land around it. But there were only a very few houses there. And um, the uh, Island Creek Pond is another um, one that uh, is, um, oops, sorry, um, is, uh, it's adjacent to Tinkertown, but it really defines a lot of the, the history of Tinkertown because the brook that runs out of Island Creek Pond uh, had a sawmill on it. Uh, there were early herring runs there. They've been restored um, again, but the, um, the, the reason for Tinkertown developed around things like the sawmill and the herring run and um, other things like that. And in the 20th century, um, there was also a um, uh, summer camp um, on the on the um, eastern side of Island Creek Pond called Tinkertown Acres. So um, we're going to get into the to the the heart of Tinkertown now. But um, I hope I, I'm trying something, and you can all tell me at the end whether this works or not. But um, there really were four about four families that really built up Tinkertown, uh, built the old houses and various branches of them. So we're going to be kind of skipping around in the time period. Um, we're not going um, linearly, but, but by family clusters. So hopefully this works. Hopefully I don't uh, lose you in the, in the, in the process. Um, but um, this is a, a wonderful old um, picture of coming into Tinkertown. Uh, we're heading west, uh, just coming over the, the brook there. Um, and that house you see on the left, uh, the Cape, uh, is, was the, uh, the oldest house in Tinkertown, uh, about 1757, which is why the, the sign uh, gives that date. And it was built by the Seabury family, who didn't stay around too long. Um, they had been in Duxbury for a while, but they too also went off to Maine, uh, like Jeremiah Dillingham did. In fact, uh, they ended up in the same town. So that's interesting. Um, but uh, it really was um, early on, uh, this house was taken, uh, was uh, owned by an, uh, the Darling family. And many of the Darlings spread out through Tinkertown and their, um, their descendants, their, their children and grandchildren built some of the houses in Tinkertown. The other family that, that owned it for many, many years was the Cushing family. And they too uh, figure very heavily into the, um, the story of Tinkertown. And we'll learn more about them in just a minute. Um, unfortunately, this house uh, was uh, the victim 
of our first um, demolition delay in Duxbury that didn't work. Um, it, it was taken down in 1999, so almost 21 years ago, um, that it didn't, uh, it, it was um, slated for demolition. It was held up uh, while people tried to figure out a, a different uh, a way of saving it, uh, but that didn't happen. So unfortunately, that uh, house is no longer there, but uh, we have lots of other ones to talk about. One of the other Cushing family houses is 209 Elm, which was built by Benjamin Cushing. Uh, and he was, um, he was a shoemaker, like, like many, a farmer and a shoemaker. And, um, you know, we tend to think of shoemaking or cord waning, the old, old term, um, as being not terribly successful, like sort of a desperate um, measure for, and, and it was true for, for some families. But it seems like for many of the Tinkertown families, not only was it their mainstay, but it was a very profitable way of making a living. And they built a number of, of houses from their, their, their um, income from sh shoemaking. But um, so Benjamin was one of these. It was built 1845 or so. Uh, and um, he had a number of apprentices, and his children were the ones who um, who created the. Um, they owned extensive land, sort of all around Island Creek Palm, and created um, the Tinkertown Acres um, summer camp. Also, it was also earlier known as Cushing Grove, um, and one of its big draws was it had a billiard table, um, and. Then in the 1930s, uh, it was also a very large depot for, um, <clears throat> for the bootleggers to stash their liquor in before distributing it. So um, the Cushings uh, made their living through various means through the years, but they built some very um, beautiful and sturdy houses. Um, uh, one of the owners starting in the 1920s was Catherine Russell, and she eventually gave a large chunk of the land on the um, west uh, side of uh, Island Creek Pond to the Historical Society for a um, bird and sort of wildlife sanctuary. So uh, that's a great part of the story. Um, the next house that was a, a Cushing house really w uh, was this one at 228 Elm. Uh, which uh, stood next to the old Seabury house. Um, and this was built by Benjamin's sister, Sarah, and her husband, Joshua Cushing. And uh, it was built in the 1850s. Um, and uh, he, was, um, uh, he was a shoemaker as well, Joshua Windsor, sorry. Uh, uh, and w one of the Windsors of, uh, of um, the Joshua Windsor, um, obviously, he was the grandson of of uh, Joshua Windsor, one of the many. But uh, clearly prosperous by by the the beautiful look of the house uh, built in the sort of Greek revival style. But uh, this house and um, and the old Seabury house, and we can jump back to that picture. Um, in the 20th century became property of the Johnson family um, who had, uh, were florists and had greenhouses and ran a, a, a floral shop there. And we'll see, uh, we'll talk more about them in, in a bit, but um, the, the old Seabury house uh, and um, Joshua Windsor's house was um, uh, part of the, the, the floral empire of the of the Johnsons. So um, the next Cushing house built was 254 Elm, uh, and this was uh, one of the last uh, built in the, in the uh, in the old part of of Tinkertown, and it was built by Nelson uh, Cushing and his wife Hattie, who was a Chandler. And Hattie's brother Gershom Chandler was a very well known. Uh, house builder. Uh, he lived up in Hall's Corner and built many, many houses in the uh, starting in the 1890s. And I'm sure he probably built this for his sister and and her husband. Um, unfortunately, Hattie, uh, the house was built in 1908, as you can see, um, and uh, in what they 
would call a cottage style um, house. But unfortunately, Hattie died in 1912. So she didn't get to live in her house f for very long. Um, and then uh, in 1913, Nelson had to sell the property. So it passed out of the Cushing family. But one um, 20th century history nugget for you all is that um, in the 1950s, it was owned by the Porter family, Bernice and Tom Porter. And he was a sort of a semi-retired printer. And in his back garage, he had a, a, a press. And that is where the Clipper was first printed starting in 1950. Uh, and in fact, um, the Cutler's um, uh, uh, say that it was Tom Porter who who came up with the name Duxbury Clipper uh, for our lo local newspaper. So, so that's, that's a great part of the story of, of this property. Um, we're now going to go to the other end of Elm Street, um, uh, where uh, Namaya Peterson, and here's Princess Peterson again, um, and it, it was her father, brother, or both, who were the, the tinkers that came to this house um, in the... Um, you know, uh, pre-revolution uh, era and um, would stay and and uh, it got known that the, um, that he was there and people would come with their pots and pans and, and things like that. And, and that's how the name Tinkertown came about. This house was originally a half cape and then was, um, was added on to, um, at a certain point. It stayed actually in the Peterson family. It passed through various um, relatives and the names changed, but it stayed um, in the Peterson family into the uh, 20th century. So it, it's, a, it's a fabulous uh, property there. And uh, there's a great story about, um, uh, we often hear that, that um, that thing, George Washington slept here. Well, this house gets the claim that, um, and, and it's true as, as far as we can tell, that Daniel Webster slept here. Um, there's a letter from him uh, saying that, uh, uh, that is in the Bradford collection, saying that he um, would often come, and one of his favorite times was hunting at Island Creek Pond and staying with um, one of the Bryants, who was um, the owners at the time, but um, it was Mrs. Bryant who was a Peterson. So anyway, Daniel Webster apparently slept in the, uh, in, in the, the bedroom uh, there when he would come hunting, and he, he fondly recalls the, his times in Tinkertown. So they get to legitimately claim that uh, Daniel Webster uh, slept in this house. Um, Namaya and, and Princess had had a large family, um, and they were um, they stayed around uh, for for many years. Um, the house next door was their um, uh, son's house, two seventy five Elm Street. Um, Isaias, or I guess uh, we could even say it like the hurricane. Isaias uh, Peterson and, and his wife Lydia, and it was built about 1812. Um, they too were like so many Tinkertown people were uh, farmers as well as shoemakers. A and you can see even today that, that these houses in Tinkertown have still large lots uh, that um, go back um, from the houses on the street. And um, they were... Um, uh, so they use that land for farming. Um, one of the distinctive parts of this, as well as the other Peterson property, was that they had red earth, as they called it, or red soil. There was a lot of um, iron in the in the grounds in the back, and in fact, there's a um, where the cranberry bogs are. There's a brook called Bog Iron Brook, and that was another industry, small industry that Tinkertown supported itself on in the period of the, you know, revolution era um, and, and early 18th century was um, um, mining bog iron, which, which basically just comes out of the, uh, is in the ground and kind of scooped up through the, um, and then has to be um, processed. But uh, there's, a, there's a large ledge back behind um, 
these houses on the um, north side of Elm Street. It's variously known as Sprague's Ledge or Jake's Ledge, but it, it's a granite ledge. And so many of these houses and many of the older houses in Duxbury probably have granite that was quarried from Sprague's Ledge. It's not a, it's not a large uh, ledge, but it certainly uh, provided an income for many families and, and foundations for their houses over the years. Um, so uh, let's see, where are we now? Um, this is another, across the street, another Peterson house uh, built by um, uh, Is uh, Isaias's uh, and um, Lydia's son, Martin, uh, built about 1848. Um, and uh, they owned a, a small piece of land across the street. And that's, that's what Martin got to build his house. Uh, and he didn't stay too, too long. He sold it um, by 1859 to a man named John Olin, who was a watchmaker from, um, he, he originally was from Nantucket. Um, and then he also didn't stay very long uh, in the house and ended up in Cambridge. I'm not sure how much in, in 1859 um, Duxbury was buying watches uh, back then, but he was definitely all of his life uh, was a was a watchmaker. Uh, after that time, it it came into the Cushing Cushing family again. So one one of the um, the sons, uh, William Cushing, owned that. Um, and then after uh, William Cushing's time, it became one of the Windsors' house, uh, Everett Windsor. So you can see the the inner twining of, of these Tinkertown families over the years with these properties um, and, and how they, um, how they, they really uh, uh, were built by, by um, branches of the same family and then were, were, were passed on. Um, oops. Um, so um, we're now back on, on the north side of, um, of, um, Elm Street. And this is a uh, house built by the Soule family in 1905. Uh, and um, it actually is um, through the Peterson family because there was an earlier house here on the property uh, built by um, Nancy Peterson and her husband, William Soule. So the, she, she was the sister of uh, uh, Isaias uh, next door. And they built a house um, in the uh, 1840s. Um, and then uh, about 1905, their son, uh, Herbert, um, took down the house and, and built this present one. And um, uh, he, he, Herbert was a shoemaker early on, uh, but he was also part of that change of um, occupation in Tinkertown where he uh, had a cranberry bog and began to um, get some of his income from cranberry growing. And, and that, that happened turn of the century-ish as, as people began to, um, began to, um, to build a, uh, and, and reach out for, for different occupations than shoemaking. So, um, so this replaces an older house um, uh, about 1905. And then across the street again, uh, Herbert and uh, Lillian built this house at 266 Elm in 1916, which is interesting because it's really only about 10 years after, um, after they, they uh, replaced his father's house. And, you know, I was trying to figure out why they, they did that. Um, was this going to be a retirement house, smaller house, or, or what? They, they only had one son, uh, uh, Willie Soul. And I, I'm wondering if it was uh, built either for him or for them, and he would have the other house. Um, he ended up not staying in, in Duxbury until the end of his life. Um, and um, he uh, was... Uh, uh, car dealer in Brockton and Easton. 
So it, it's still somewhat of a mystery as to why the souls built this house because they held on to it and didn't sell it until the 19, late 1930s. So I think the hope was that maybe Willie would come back to, to Duxbury. Anyway, there's always good uh, still uh, mysteries uh, to have in, uh, in, in histories like this. Um, here's a map from 1857, just showing the sort of growth. If you think back to the 1833 map, uh, the, the street is filling in with, with houses here. And, um, and you can see those names popping up, the, the Petersons and the Cushings and the Windsors, and, and they're all in there. Um, uh, and by 1857, um, Duxbury was really kind of in the throes of its uh, depressed era, and yet um, Tinkertown was actually booming, and, and it was because of shoemaking, and they were very successful shoemakers um, who, who made their living, and this was pre-factory, but, but they would make their, their shoes in the houses or in the little sheds or, or whatever, um, and then the, the, um, the owners, the, the bigger shoe dealers from places like Brockton and Abington and Rockland would come along and, and pick up the, the finished shoes. Uh, just uh, this is an interesting kind of um, look at where um, the kids went to school in in Tinkertown through the years. On on the left hand side of the screen is a map, um, and if you look way up in the corner of that map, you can see an X with um, a 150, uh, and that's just about where the highway crosses under Elm Street today. It's a little east of it. Uh, but that was where there was an original schoolhouse um, it, uh, in this area. And um, there were only four schoolhouses in Duxbury starting in the 1715, 1720. And this was one of them. Uh, and it, it was kind of trying to accommodate the families, not only in Tinkertown, but Tarkiln and the Island Creek area. Um, there's a wonderful old name um, for the, that intersection of Elm and Oak Street um, called Schoolhouse Hollow, uh, which I, I love that name because if you, if you think of it, it, it is, uh, it's at the bottom of a hill um, and um, it's, uh, it, it's a great old name to, to just remember. But um, the schoolhouse was at the top of the hill um, and uh, existed for, for, for a number of years, and the schoolmaster would make his rounds between the four um, schools in Duxbury, uh, so that they really only had school there maybe three months out of the year. Um, the next school that the, uh, that the Tinkertown uh, kids went to was on the right, um, and that too was somewhat of a, of a walk. Uh, it, it was over on Tremont Street, um, just about where, maybe a little um, west of where um, Flintlock Drive comes into Tremont Street today, uh, it, just above the, the mill pond there. And that was the South Schoolhouse. And that was from about 1810 to somewhere in the, um, this is from the 1833 map, so at least into the 1830s. Um, and and um, so this, the kids had to walk uh, along that way, uh, along Oak Street, and then uh, cut through the fields over to the schoolhouse. And that seems to have been the origin of the street name School Street, um, because there isn't wasn't a school on School Street, but it was the way they took to the schoolhouse, particularly that earlier one on the um, uh, on Tremont Street. But by the um, 1840s, it, it had moved again. And whether the building itself was moved, I'm not sure, but it, it was moved to the corner of Oak and um, Park and um, Tremont Street. And you can see that in the, um, in the, lower map where it says school number three. Um, and that was from the 1840s. And um, here is a very dim picture, but it shows the schoolhouse uh, in its original location there, right on the corner. Uh, and it was a typical um, Duxbury schoolhouse, door on either side, one for girls, one for boys, with, and a window in the middle. 
here's a better picture of the Island Creek Schoolhouse um, being moved. And, and you can see, not a very large structure, um, but it was moved from Island Creek in 1944 to um, what was then Duxbury High School, which is now Duxbury Free Library, um, and stood in the back uh, right-hand side, sort of where the Ellison Playground is today. And that became the Home Ec Cottage, they called it, but they outfitted it with um, stoves and it was uh, for the home economics courses. So the, uh, the Island Creek Schoolhouse had a, had a further life, but it, it served the Tinkertown families many, many years um, until the 1920s when the, um, when the um, Duxbury schools were consolidated. Let's get back to Tinkertown. This is a house on the corner of Oak and uh, Elm on the south side, 306 Elm. And uh, again, a fascinating history that, that we think we know a little bit about, but it's, it still has some mysteries to it. The house was moved there, and it was moved about 1812. Um, and it was very likely moved from um, up on Oak Street, right on the corner where the Josephus Dawes house is today, the very fancy mansarded roof house um, opposite Bennett's store there on the corner of Oak Street. And, um, and this simple cape was, was moved down about 1812 by one of the Chandler family, who had married one of the Darling family. And this began a, a long chain of, of Chandlers that lived in this property, um, at, in this house at the corner of um, uh, Oak and Elm. Uh, here's, here's a picture about 1900 of the house. Um, and you can see a very uh, sturdy but simple cape, and um, uh, and it stayed in the um, in the Chandler family for a number of of, of years. Uh, again, like like so many of those Tinkertown families, it, it passed from father to son and all. One of the houses that um, was built. Um, by uh, Chandler, um, Rebecca Chandler, and her husband Francis Sears. This is 248 Elm. And this is an older picture of, of the house. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with it today um, as uh, the, the Savages House, but that was uh, that uh, piece of property came from and was built by the, the, the Chandler family. Um, and after the Sears, uh, uh, stopped owning it. It was owned by one of the Cushing family. So again, you see the intertwinings of these Tinkertown families and the buying and selling of these houses over the years between just uh, 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 four or five families. Here's a wonderful view of uh, Elm Street. Uh, probably roughly turn of the century, you can see um, uh, 245 Elm Street off to the right. This is looking east, so we're standing, the photographer is as his back to uh, Tarkiln and, and looking east. But at a certain point, they, they were trying to call um, Tinkertown Elm Street Village, um, because apparently uh, the, the name Tinkertown didn't suit certain people or felt that it was sort of a uh, um, not a great name. So uh, fortunately, Elm Street Village didn't really stick, although you very clearly see that a number of these trees are elm trees. And so it is appropriate that Elm Street is named that as well as that, um, that the, uh, uh, the village tried to get its name changed to Elm Street Village. Here's another map from 1879, um, again showing how um, many of the houses uh, in Tinkertown were, were built then. Um, and, um, and it was, uh, it was a, a, a way that um, people passed through and, and were heading towards uh, Boston, Tarkiln, Pembroke, whatever. Um, but that also um, provided a number of um, uh, income for for particularly the the shoemakers. So um, 242 Elm, which is on the south side of the street, um, this is a uh, this is the the kind of fourth family, if you will, uh, of Tinkertown, the Dawes and Simmons family, 
And um, they built this uh, quite large house here um, in 1842. It was a two family. Um, and they were, um, uh, not only were they, they farmers, but they were, um, they were, um, they were shoemakers and um, uh, Edward Simmons had married um, Harriet Dawes. So that's how, um, how the property, but her, her brother uh, Alan uh, lived in the other half of the, of the house. Here's another picture of it. Um, you can see it's, it, it, was, um, it was the largest house in, in Tinkertown at the time. And for a time was called Elm Hall. It, it really wasn't a public hall, but it, it had that sort of grandeur that, that, um, uh, that uh, many of the houses in, in Tinkertown are, are just simple capes. But it did burn in 1912 after the, um, the Dawes and the Simmons sold it. It, it burnt um, in quite a spectacular fire and it was never rebuilt. What did survive was its barn. And um, this is uh, the barn after its renovation in 1963. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful house right in the middle of Tinkertown. Here's another picture of the, of the barn, um, sort of from the backside from School Street. Uh, but uh, the, the house was never rebuilt but the barn stayed. Here's a 1903 uh, map showing uh, again how Tinkertown uh, is uh, um, uh, really filled in by its, uh, by its, um, all of its houses uh, about then. There was uh, one or two more to come, but, uh, and, and how much of its, um, its school and its um, the train was here by 1903, so the Island Creek Station was up the street, uh, but it was its own distinct neighborhood away from from Island Creek. But they they used uh, the post office and and all. Um, so here's another Dawes house on the opposite side of. Uh, of Elm Street, 245 Elm. And this was built by uh, James and Abby Dawes. Um, and James was uh, one of three brothers who were all quite well-known sea captains, uh, very successful. They were master mariners. Um, his claim to fame was that he made it from San Francisco to um, Yokohama, I think, in 35 days. Um, and Abby, his, his wife, uh, went on a number of voyages too, but all, three of the Dawes brothers were, um, were ship captains. Uh, and James uh, Simmons, um, who was a nephew, later uh, owned the property um, from his uncle. So here's the house today. And um, what's interesting is that some of the architectural historians who have looked at Tinkertown feel that maybe that side L to 245 Elm was actually the older house of the parents of the Dawes because Abraham Dawes um, was the father of, of these other Dawes and he had a house here that um, was either taken down or, uh, or incorporated into um, his son's house here uh, in, the, um, in the 1850s. Um, where that house stood was where 239 Elm is today, and that was um, uh, built in 1865 by um, another Dawes, by Deborah Dawes and, and her husband Orzo Woodward. Um, so uh, this too was a house that um, passed through the same family, and yet it's um, its name changed because it was it was through the women uh, that these um, uh, uh, that the property stayed. Uh, this is uh, yet another Dawes Simmons house, uh, two fifty five Elm, uh, which was built by Abbott Simmons, um, who was one of the the sons, um, and he was. Um, it's interesting, he wasn't, um, he didn't stay very long uh, at the house. He, he moved to, a, to another part of Duxbury. Um, uh, he was there about, um, oh, about um, 10 years or so, I think. Um, 
But uh, in the 1920s, it was bought by Laura and George Mayer, who, uh, George Mayer was a, was a dentist and he had his practice here in this house. And, um, and so, uh, and they were there for a number of years into the 1940s. So um, people remember going uh, to the dentist in this house. And his daughter uh, was Arlene Bunton, who, who bought the Namaya Peterson house next door. So again, the intertwining of the, of the families in Tinkertown continued well into the 20th century. Um, here's another view of Tinkertown, again, looking north um, towards, um, uh, towards uh, Island Creek Pond and all. Um, winter, clearly, but, but those beautiful elm trees uh, just lined the, the street there. Um, jumping into the, into the 20th century, here is a 1940s map, a uh, geodesic map, showing Tinkertown. And, and what I like about it is that it shows, this is pre-Route um, 3, so it, it helps us to see the, the landscape as it was in the early 20th century, um, and just how the, the the cranberry bogs are popping up along Oak Street and back of Tinkertown, and that really became a focus of much of the um, part of the the way the Tinkertown families made their money. Um, here are some uh, great ads from um, mainly from old yearbooks, uh, but uh, you can see that the Johnson flowers uh, were a very big going concern all the way into the 1960s. Then it was sold to the McCall family, and that was in that old um, Seabury house that um, was where their main, uh, but it was a, had greenhouses and floral, uh, they telegraphed flowers, um, and the print shop has, has an ad too. That was uh, where the, the small print shop where the clipper was first printed. This is a great uh, map. It's, it's a little hard to see, but it's a 1961 map. So it's as the Route 3 is being built. And if you see just west of Tinkertown, there was a temporary exit on Route 3 where the highway was finished up until Elm Street, and then the very last stretch of Route 3 was the Duxbury chunk. And so people had to get off, and you can see a little island there, and they had to get off onto Elm Street and then continue their journey along um, Route 53. Um, but um, it was only for a, a, a few years that this was the case, but um, it diverted traffic uh, off that final section of Route 3 while they were making the final building and link of Route 3. And that, of course, changed not just Duxbury, but the South Shore, but, but also Tinkertown, that we start getting into um, what I like to call greater Tinkertown, because um, the neighborhoods expanded uh, beyond the, the old part of Tinkertown, and um, there were only two houses on Oak Street in the early 1960s, and by the late 1960s, there were eight or 10 houses. And, and neighborhoods grew um, uh, in, in sort of in incremental ways uh, around Tinkertown. And, and this fostered a whole um, feeling of, uh, of, of neighborliness and, and a need to know your neighbors and, and to meet them and all. And the Tinkertown Neighborhood Association, which is a very a strong and, and uh, uh, vibrant neighborhood organization was started initially in 1970 uh, by the Green family who lived in the old, uh, they converted the barn from the house that burnt and um, they lived there. But they, they really uh, were some of the neighbors that started the, the neighborhood association. They learned about the history of Tinkertown. And then um, they began a series of neighborhood events over the years that really helped to pull the neighborhood, and, and this is not just um, old Tinkertown, but greater Tinkertown as well, into, um, they had um, Santa Claus uh, arriving by, by horse and buggy in, uh, in the early 1980s. And that's when um, Tinkertown's most famous uh, um, event started as well, the Luminaries, uh, which uh, is um, well-known 
across Massachusetts, really. And, and again, fostered a, a wonderful neighborliness amongst the, the various parts of Tinkertown as it, it started small in the, in the 1980s um, and then spread to, to many of the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the, the glow of the luminaries at night on Christmas Eve or is, is something really special. Um, the other thing that Tinkertown did th through many years and still today is created fabulous 4th of July floats. And here's one from 1980. And, and it, again, it was a, it was, um, the, the, it brought the neighborhood together and made neighbors get to know each other and enjoy each other and, and really fostered that old fashion feeling that, that Tinkertown always had through the, the interrelated families. And this grew through the various neighborhoods like Tinkertown Landing that, that began to um, uh, come into its own in the 1980s. Um, and one of the last um, houses moved into Tinkertown is, is this wonderful house at 215 Elm. And it wasn't until uh, 1986. It was built in Kingston, right next to where um, the Big Y Plaza is today, right next to McDonald's. And it was moved by Betsy Schlesinger and she rescued it. It was cut in half and moved to Tinkertown and sits very proudly in the middle of Tinkertown and fits right in uh, with its, uh, with its uh, Greek revival uh, look uh, from the 1840s. So you can see we're, we're kind of circling back to uh, to Tinkertown and how what a fabulous neighborhood it is, and um, and that's why I bring up the slow down sign again, because I think I, I I think if you slow down as you drive through Tinkertown, you begin to see the landscape, the houses, and everything else as just wonderful. Uh, a wonderful part of Duxbury that has been preserved over the years, and not just preserved, it's grown and changed uh, as it should, uh, but it's been the neighborhood that's done that, the neighbors and the families that own these properties and, and um, foster that feeling of, uh, of a, a, a wonderful part of Duxbury. So I'll leave you with this uh, last picture uh, of, uh, of Tinkertown in, um, around 1900, and um, I am happy to take questions from Aaron or, or whatever, but thank you all for just listening, and uh, I hope uh, you learn some things about Tinkertown and, and um, really see what a wonderful neighborhood it is. Tony, that was wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing all of that with us. It's incredible the amount of research that you've, you've turned up on them. But it's, you know, geographically a relatively small area of Duxbury. It's amazing how much history can be in one area. That's I'm going to direct everyone's attention to the chat box right now. Now's a great time to take a few minutes and drop your questions in there. We have a few already, but I'll give you a minute to put yours in as well. I encourage questions as well as personal recollections or memories or stories. We'd be happy to share any of them. Um, Tony, are you ready for a few questions? I am. Yep. Okay. Uh, first of all, I have I have uh, one from Norm and Evelyn for 209 Elm Street. Was the Russell family who lived there until 1960 related to the original Cushing family? And who were the bootleggers that you mentioned? Uh, well, the, the bootleggers were... Um, the Cushing family was... was uh, it wasn't the... F that branch of the family that lived in that house, but it was the um, the Levi Cushing family in Hall's Corner that um, were um, quite involved in in bootlegging, and so um, it, it was a branch of the family. Uh, it was also that part of um, uh, what was where the uh, the liquor was was really stashed was in this. Um, at this sort of summer camp called Cushing Grove originally, and then Tinkertown Acres, and it was bought from the Cushings in the 19, late 1920s by Buck Freeman, who was another well-known bootlegger in Duxbury. So um, yes, it, it, it uh, as far as we know, they didn't stash the liquor in Tinkertown itself, but um, but there were families that were 
uh, involved in that very profitable um, enterprise. Thank you. Uh, Joy Mills would like to know, now that we know, now we know about Elm Street, uh, why does it change to Toby Garden Street? Oh, that's a very good question, Joy. And, and you know, I meant to say something about Toby Garden. I, that's a good question. Um, Toby Garden Street, the name, comes about because, um, and it's a very, it, it appears in that 1762 layout of that entire road from, from Tremont Street down. Um, apparently it was known as Toby's Garden because um, the original Freeman, Joseph Freeman, who there are a million Freemans that, that um, came from Joseph and his family and spread out all over Duxbury and are, 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 are branches of them in Duxbury still today. He married, he was from Sandwich, and he married a woman named Tabitha Toby, who was described in the notes as an Indian princess. Now, <laughs> we have to kind of take that with a, a bit of a grain of salt, but she probably a Native American Wampanoag um, uh, of uh, probably from the Mashpee group if she she came from Sandwich. But anyway, apparently her father, uh, there was a lot of fathers visiting their daughters, would come um, and um, he had a, a quite a large field and garden along the, the hillside of, of Toby Garden Street. So that's how Toby's Garden got its name. Now, why it changed from Toby Garden to Elm, that I don't have a good answer for, why it's not one or the other all the way through. I have a couple of comments here, or you know, stories. Um, uh, sorry, they're coming fast and they're scrolling on me. Richard <laughs> Tingblad says, thank you, I learned a great deal. My grandfather, William Wadsworth Seals, Sears, was born in Tinkertown in 1870. And uh, Christine Tissot says to everyone that Nehemiah was a Revolutionary War s soldier. Casey Seaman asks, where can you find more information on the personal histories of particular homes? Which I can answer. Uh, many of the homes, particularly the ones that are date boarded by the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society, uh, we post those date board histories every Friday or most Fridays on our social media pages. So if you follow Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, you can find a new date board history on a selected home posted each, each week. Um, and we are collecting those histories as they're wit written and putting them on our website under date board, um, date boarding your home on our website. Um, that is an ongoing project, so you will not find all of the houses on our website, but you'll find our start project. Um, and I encourage you to keep checking back at our website as we will post uh, more of those histories as they become available. All of the it's, date board uh, histories, and there are more than 250 homes that are date board in Duxbury right now, those date board histories are kept um, for researchers and posterity at the Drew Archival Library, which is operated by the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society on St. George Street, and it is open for researchers and visitation. Right now it's by appointment only, but I encourage you to give us a call or to ca contact Carolyn Ravenscroft, our historian, if you have an interest in a particular house. And just a note to Casey, we'll talk because your house needs a date board and it doesn't have one. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're on okay. our radar, Casey. That's right. Um, <laughs> with regard to Greater Tinkertown, does today's Tinkertown extend to any part of Tremont Street? Well, it, it does. I mean, then you're blending into, you know, Island Creek, but they've always kind of blended. But um, the the neighbors along um, Flintlock Drive do luminaries and, and you know, it, it's all part of the um, fostering of the neighborliness of, of that whole area. Um, but it's it's also goes way back because so much of the property was was large chunks of land way back then. So... Mary Brad Bradshaw asks, was there an area where the tinker shops were clustered? Um, similarly, were the shoes made in sheds of farmers or were the shoemakers producing shoes in specific buildings? Please expand on the connection between Tinkertown shoes and Rockham. Uh, well, the, the, there weren't really tinker shops. There really seems to have been only one tinker, this either John or Jeremiah 
Dillingham or both uh, father and son. But anyway, um, he, he just came in and stayed with his, his daughter for apparently a number of weeks or whatever. Um, and, uh, and people knew about him and came to, to the Nemaya Peterson house to get their pots fixed. But the shoemaking, um, yes, the, the various families did it in various ways. Um, and, uh, but they involved either separate shops or, or those sort of shed additions that you see, particularly on the Tinkertown houses where they had, um, uh, you know, uh, they are, they're, they're separate barns as well. And um, the, the Brockton um, connection w was that whole area, their, their factories of, of shoes that were, were well known starting in the Civil War came about because of towns like Duxbury and that, that, that the, um, the factory owners before the big factories w would parcel out the business to um, people all over, uh, families all over the South Shore and then come and, and, and pick up the shoes um, and, and bring them to, to Brockton to be shipped and sold and, and all of that. So the consolidation of that business happened into a factory. So, We are uh, running out of time right now. Uh, I have a lot of questions still to be answered, but I'm afraid that we are running out of time for the afternoon. What I'm doing right now is putting my email into the chat box. And uh, for those of you who have your questions unanswered, I encourage you to send your questions to me at my address. And I will endeavor between me and Tony to get them answered for all of you. Thank you very much to Tony for joining us tonight. It was Fantastic, Tony, and we really appreciate your volunteer time for the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. Well, I'm happy to do it, and uh, Tinkertown was a, a, a wonderful uh, neighborhood to do, and, and like I said, I learned a lot because there have been um, various people over the years who have, have recorded much of the history, but, but the pulling together and, and all, particularly the, the interconnectedness of those four or five families was, was astounding to me. Um, which is what created Tinkertown. So hopefully we can go on to other neighborhoods in Duxbury. <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, please keep an eye out. We have a lot of wonderful things coming down the pipeline at the DRHS, and we would love to see you there later this winter. Have a great evening. Yeah. Good night. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>